And Alberto, will you, it's recording as well. Good. I'm recording as well, yes. Everyone just mute uh, when you're not talking. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Fadi and I'm with the Human Resources for Development Unit at ICAP headquarters in New York. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Grand Rounds webinars hosted by ICAP. Um, just a reminder to everyone that we will be using the chat function um, for question and answers. So at any point during the presentation, if you have a question, please feel free to use the chat button to type in your question. Our moderator today is our fearless leader at ICAP, Dr. Wafa El Sadr, and she'll be introducing the speaker um, for today's Grand Rounds. Thank you, over to you, Wafa. Thank you very much, Fatima, and uh, welcome to all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this uh, ICAP webinar. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Cohen, uh, who will be giving uh, the webinar today. And uh, Dr. Cohen is the Jurgen Bate Eminent Professor of Medicine, Microbiology, Immunology, and Epidemiology at the University of North Carolina, uh, at Chapel Hill, and he also serves as the Vice Chancellor for Global Health at the University and the Director for the Institute uh, for Global Health and Infectious Diseases. Uh, Dr. Cohen is also uh, has received many, many awards over his illustrious career and uh, has played a significant role in the whole area of HIV prevention research overall. And as many of you are aware, he led the groundbreaking HPTN 052 study. Most recently, he has also been uh, playing a critical leadership role in COVID-related research, uh, particularly in the area of the potential use of monoclonal antibodies for prevention, as well as treatment of uh, COVID-19. Um, I am very honored to have served as the co-PI, Principal Investigator of the HIV Prevention Trials Network uh, with Dr. Cohen for the past several years and have um, uh, enjoyed uh, the opportunity to work with him closely as we have uh, worked diligently towards advancing uh, the efforts, the global efforts for, um, if, for the prevention of HIV uh, transmission and acquisition. Uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Cohen will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, answering your questions. So you can put in your questions anytime during the webinar in the chat uh, function at the bottom of your screen, and then we'll tackle the questions at the end. Dr. Cohen. Uh, thanks, thanks, Wafa. Um, well, let me, let me just say that uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to your, your, your colleagues and the, your group at ICAP. <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to do, as, as Wafa said, she and I have been partners on the NIAID-sponsored um, network called the HIV Prevention Trials Network. That is a bookend to the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. And there are partners. So the Vaccine Trials Network tries to use that particular biological, single biological tool for the prevention of HIV acquisition, <clears throat> whereas the HPTN is kind of set up for everything else. Um, all the non-vaccine related prevention efforts that are possible. And I think we've made contributions over the last seven, well, often I've been working on this about 10 years, uh, but for the last seven years, we've served as a leader of this network. And we know that the network's gonna go forward uh, for the next seven years. Um, and um, so in my talk today, I'm gonna try and describe kind of a little bit of where we're at and where we're going, but I would hope that the people listening You'll, you'll see that we're at a point where we're kind of making our plans. There's a pipeline and a planning process. So I would hope that the questions could also be comments about where we ought to go um, in, in the next seven years. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna show slides. A lot of this will be, and, and these will not be 
inclusive of everything we're doing, but they're kind of highlight slides. So the, the first point is to reiterate, the mission of the Prevention Tiles Network is to integrate prevention strategies. And um, I think for the, maybe the first, this network's now more than 20 years old, we spent a lot of time on treatment as prevention, and I think we established that that is a central feature of HIV prevention worldwide. Now, as we go forward, we need new tools to integrate uh, in combination prevention that will maximize the reduction of HIV uh, transmission and acquisition. And I think the things that we focused a lot on in our preparations for the future are uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis using biological agents to complement our treatment as prevention. Um, and we've also become increasingly concerned about strategies that are much more precise uh, for new for key populations or new populations or those at greatest risk. And we'll have this called this precision prevention. And I think that's a reasonable uh, way of looking at it. So the biological tools for HIV prevention. Well, the treatment as prevention part, I'm not going to go into because we, we've done that. For PrEP, we just really have uh, right now two approved agents. Both are, are, are pills that can be taken daily. One is the tenofovir amtocytobine combination known as Truvada, made by Gilead. The other is the combination of the alfinamide version of tenofovir uh, with amtocytobine known as Discovi. Uh, Discovi is only currently approved for uh, men of sex with men uh, because uh, trials were not done uh, to date. Uh, in women. Truvada is approved uh, for prevention in both men and women. And in the U.S., these approvals are, are uh, for daily pill usage. <clears throat> the, it is possible and likely that at least for men, kind of imperfect use of Truvada is sufficient to provide protection, although the protection may not be as perfect as if it's used daily. So the real issue for us in this, in this going forward in the pre-exposure prophylaxis space is the pipeline and in in the tool kit development. Now, before I go there, I wanna point out that one of the, probably the biggest concern and limitation of the pill approach has been in reliable usage of, of pills, especially in young women in Sub-Saharan Africa who have shown themselves to be historically at great risk of HIV acquisition. Our, co our, our colleague, Connie Kellum, with a large team of investigators, undertook a study to see if she could improve um, the reliability of usage of the Truvada combination in uh, or TDF-FTC combination in young women in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they did a randomized study uh, of, of 646 uh, people. Um, and in the end of the day, um, it was a study designed to see whether Truvada usage would improve with a lot of support for Truvada usage. And the kind of details of the study are shown in the slide. And it's a very straightforward question. One that other groups have asked as well, how do we get people to use TDF FTC better? How do we get young women at high risk to use TDF FTC better? And the results are really, really interesting and have been presented in abstract form and will soon be presented, I think, in manuscript form, a few different manuscripts. But basically, when asked if, if young women who might participate wanted to take pills for pre-exposure prophylaxis, the vast majority said yes. And, but then, surprisingly, when there was the feedback arm versus the no feedback arm, there wasn't a lot of difference in the, the demonstrated uh, uh, continued use of the drug. And kind of sadly, lots of women who were taking the drugs had the same problem we've seen in the past called a failure of persistence. That is women um, stopped using the drugs after some period of time as regularly as they did at the beginning of the study. But then there was a very surprising finding. Across this study, the incidence was very, very low. Um, and in comparable studies in Sub-Saharan Africa, incidence of HIV acquisition was three to 5%. But in this PrEP study where even the women, or at least some of the women said they were no longer using PrEP or there was no longer PrEP in their bloodstream, there was still a very, very low incidence rate, 1% or less. And when you try and do a counterfactual, you see that this is a, a really uh, a remarkable finding. And, and we have a couple of explanations, none of, neither of which have been proven, but which are the subject of manuscripts that are kind of provocative. 
One is, well, it's possible, I guess, that young women stopped having uh, relations, you know, that their behaviors changed dramatically, sexual behaviors changed dramatically. More likely, we think, is that, that women are so now familiar with these agents that they're judging their own risk and that the women who persisted to use these agents were using them because they saw persistent risks. And the women who stopped using the agents had less risk. And that's a very provocative hypothesis we're pursuing. So this OA2 study, HPD 2 study, led by Dr. Kellum and Sinead Delaney and others, it's completed and the manuscripts are forthcoming. So then the question is this toolbox, what else can we put in the toolbox? And I'm going to show you or tell you that on this slide shows you that we have an injectable agent called cabotegravir that we're well along with. We have uh, new drugs called capsid inhibitors that I'll describe very briefly. Uh, we have rings that have been the source of great attention, dipivirine rings, and maybe multi-purpose rings can be developed. We'll talk about that. And then there's the idea of putting these drugs into a form where you don't take them, but very infrequently. So let us begin with the drug we spent the most time studying, which is this cabotegravir. This is a drug that's called an integrase inhibitor, and that class of drugs is very attractive because the drugs don't need to be metabolized. They work very fast. The resistance patterns are kind of less aggressive than they are for some other drugs, and they're like a mainstay now of antiretroviral treatment, so they're very potentially very attractive for prevention as well. And <clears throat> so Dr. Landovitz and Grinstein and a very large team conducted a study in roughly 41 countries around the world, enrolling about, I think, more than 4,000, about 4,500 uh, study subjects, okay. both men who have sex with men and transgendered women into the study. And the okay. studies organized pretty straightforward. Because we weren't sure that these injections, which are gonna last about eight weeks, we can't get the drug out once we put it in. We wanted to be sure they were safe when we started. So we had the pills as an oral run-in. Um, and, and the oral run-in was simply to, uh, to demonstrate that there'd be no allergic reaction to the drug. Then subjects would receive their injections every eight weeks uh, for about uh, three years, and then uh, 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 proposed three years. And then um, at the end of the study, because these drugs hang around a long time, subjects with the drug in their blood for a long time would be asked to switch over to Truvada daily until the drug had disappeared. So there's kind of three phases of this study. And um, needless to say, we were well along in this study and a, and a, a study in women called HBTN084, well along in these studies when COVID hit and causing COVID disruption. But the COVID disruption really has not as much as we would have anticipated affected these studies. And the OA3 study was halted by the Data Safety Monitoring Board after recognizing that the injection of, that the group receiving the injections of cabotegravir, randomized against pills, the true out of pills, that that group were, were benefiting substantially um, and in fact, ultimately, <clears throat> that the injections of cabotegravir proved superior to the Truvada pill uh, application. Now, this gets a little bit complicated. It's complicated because, first of all, the overall incidence is very, very low. Um, and you can see on this slide, there were only 52 infections out of 6,389 person years. So why was the incidence so low? Because the subjects getting the Truvada pills blindly they mostly took their pills. And the subjects getting their injections came in for their injections. So you had two active agents that are both excellent agents uh, showing their benefit. And the second point is then, why would, why would we find the cabotegravir to be superior to, to the uh, Truvada agent? Both agents are very active. Both agents can avert the acquisition of HIV. But our hypothesis was that it would be difficult for people to take pills reliably for a long period of time. This brings us back to the idea that persistence is difficult. And the advantage of an injection is not necessarily a biological advantage that one agent's better than another, it's an administrative benefit. And I think that on the next slide, which is a summary of too complicated slide, and I apologize, it's a summary of all the incident infections in, in cabotegravir, which all have to be explained because if you're giving injections, they ought to be perfect. And so we're in the process of explaining 
why we saw some cavitagrel failure instead of perfect cavitagrel. But um, the bottom line is that our results generally will suggest that the reason that cavitagrel did better than Truvada is that in the 37 people who developed infection taking Truvada, they weren't taking their pills. And in the small number of people who developed infection in spite of cavitagrel, every case will be explained in one way or the other as we go forward with our publications. So as I've indicated, this, this uh, study is complete and um, manuscript uh, publications reporting the detailed results, both the uh, clinical result of, of benefits observed, both with Truvada and Cavitegavir, and then the more science-y uh, resistance level results should be out in the next few months, depending on the reviewer's comments and such. Now, I would emphasize that I've already said that one of the problems, not a problem, a, a limitation of the drug Discovy was that, that Gilead was unable when they, when they launched their men's study to kind of launch, to launch a comparative women's study for a variety of reasons. So that left them in a bind of getting approval only for men at this point in time. They're, they're seeking to do more work to get approval in women with those Discovy pills. Um, for Cavitegavir, we have a women's study called HPT-084. It's got, I believe it's just about fully enrolled with I think about 3,200 women again in many countries around the world. We're comparing, it's the exact same design as what I just proposed to you, comparing very direct, very directly blinded Truvada pills to Cavitegavir injections. And just to say a word more, the way that works is either you're getting a, a placebo pill or a, Cavite, or, or a, a Truvada pill, or you're getting a placebo injection or a cavitegavir injection. That study under Shil with Sinead Delaney and Mina Hassinapur leading the study is going extremely well. Our next over data safety oversight board is November 8th, and uh, we shall see what happens. We're very optimistic that cavitegavir will work in women just as well as it worked in men. We're really quite certain that under the conditions we're setting, that both cavitegavir and Truvada are greatly reducing HIV acquisition in young women enrolled in the study. So cavitegavir, we've put a ton of time, and now let me make it clear, this is a collaboration between uh, NIH and the uh, HIV, HIV Prevention Trials Network, Glaxo and Vive, the companies that own and make cavitegavir, and for the women's study, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this has been a robust and important collaboration. And now as we complete kind of phase one of our studies, what's next? And on the slide, I'm trying to show you where we think we're going, but we would welcome other suggestions. Where we think we're going is certainly to complete our women's study. Where we know we're going is to bridge the results in women and men to adolescent men and women. Because adolescents, of course, under 18, were usually not included in these studies, they deserve the benefits of these drugs as well. We're anticipating a study in discordant couples who might be uncomfortable where even though treatment is prevention, maybe the person who's infected isn't reliably taking their pills. So we're anticipating the potential of a study where we offer uh, cavitegavir and ropivirine combination as treatment for the infected person in a discordant couple. We are anticipating much more aggressive work with cavitegravir for prevention in pregnant women, because pregnant women are a, a pretty big risk group in some countries. And if it's if cavitegravir, the integration inhibitor uh, proves, uh, and we believe it is safe in pregnant women, it might be a very attractive drug to give during prenatal visits. We're exploring the use of cavitegravir for uh, prevention uh, during the prenatal and antenatal period. Um, we are ex exploring the combination, not we, Vive is a better way of putting it, of cavitegavir and a birth control agent in combination, and I'll come back to that in a little while. And then there can be other studies that, that I have not outlined, and I would welcome in the chat box, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Because we are kind of wide open to suggestions to Vive about ways that their drug might be better deployed. We anticipate cavitegavir will be approved for clinical usage as a treatment in 2021 and probably as a prevention agent in 2021. As a treatment agent, it's used in combination with the drug Ropivirine, which is another injectable agent. 
So we spent a lot of time in cabotegravir, but while we were spending that time, drug companies were making other drugs. And we have tried pretty aggressively to keep in contact with these companies about new drugs and then devices delivered to deliver new drugs. Merck has made, Merck has a drug called MSK8591, which is a very potent pill. Uh, it's called Islatravir now. And that pill, if you take it as a pill form, is once a month. But because the drug is so potent, if you put it in an implant, you might be able to make an implant that would last for years. Gilead has made a new drug that's a, called a capsid inhibitor. And I'll show you that it lasts for many months. It's given sub-Q, they call it Lenacaprevir. The new devices you've heard about are depivirine rings, which um, have shown a benefit in, in some women using them. And, and most recently, the, uh, the, uh, F, the EMA, the uh, uh, European Medicines Agency, has indicated a, a favorable review towards these depivirine rings as available for women in some countries. Um, I don't know what the FDA would have to review that separately, the US FDA. Then other devices are implants and then transdermal needles and patches, like you see advertised for pain control and cigarette cessation and things of that nature. So let's just talk a, a, just for a minute about Islatravir, MK8591. This is just an example of why Merck got into this business. They're giving uh, this agent to animals um, uh, in different dosages and compared to a placebo. And what happens is they're trying to prevent the acquisition of HIV or SHIV in animals, and they get perfect protection when they use a sufficient amount of this drug. So that really attracted a positive response uh, uh, of Merck using Islatravir as a prevention agent. And um, uh, Dr. Barrett, who's a chemist at Merck, was able to very aggressively take Merck's expertise in implants, which have been used for birth controls, put this drug into the same implant they use for birth control, show they could put it into humans and that the drug would uh, leach out at a level that was uh, very likely to provide protection from HIV acquisition. So the idea that <clears throat> Merck might make an implant um, is an attractive idea using this agent and an idea that, that is uh, certainly being pursued. And so Merck has a couple of op options. They can have a once a month pill prevention agent with the benefits and, and limitations of pills, or they can make an implant and with the benefits and limitations of implants. But Merck isn't <clears throat> the only, only um, group trying to make implants. So it brings us to kind of a very brief discussion of implants, which I think are potentially very important to the HPTN in the next seven years. Long acting implants. There's kind of two flavors. One flavor is called the matrix implant. There the drug is embedded in the implant and the implant just leaks out um, the drug and that leaches it out really from the matrix, uh, the lattice, and that's what the Merck implant is like. The alternative is you make some little tube that's sealed and in that tube is your drug and the drug gradually escapes from the tube over long periods of time. That's called the reservoir implant. And then there's two other options. You could make a renewable implant so you could refill a reservoir implant, for example, or you could have a matrix implant you have to remove after three years. And that's certainly those kinds of implants already exist for birth control. Or you can make a biodegradable implant that you put in and mother nature makes it just go away in some years. And the agents that are being pursued for implants include Islatravir, Merck, I've already described it. And then the drug Cabotegavir is being pursued in a reservoir implant. And then Many companies are working on um, the alfinamide version of, of tenofovir, TAF. And these are just a list of, of Oak Crest, Houston Research Trial Institute, Northwestern. They're working on, on, on various implants and other devices with TAF because it's a very potent drug that would um, kind of uh, 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 escape the implant and prevent HIV acquisition. So this is a pretty kind of robust field, the implant field. And I think it's potentially very important to the HPTN going forward. This is just a slide uh, that will, a slide that shows you um, the, uh, uh, ca the capsid inhibitor, GS6207 lent, lent, lentacaprevir. And it shows you that, that this drug, kind of shown on the little dash line, is how much drug you might need to prevent acquisition of 
HIV, and then you see how much drug there is after a sub-Q injection at different, do different doses, and you see you've got a lot of drug after 12 weeks, which is three months, and then after 16 weeks, and after 20 weeks, and all the way into six months, you've got potentially enough drug to prevent HIV acquisition. So I think Gilead is very excited about this drug. Um, what they'll have to worry about, just as we do in cabotegravir, is resistance to the agent, because the, as the agent falls in concentration, there's gonna be what we call the tail, and you see the tail starts developing here. Uh, cabotegravir has a long tail, I assume uh, 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 that the capsid inhibitor will have a long tail. So there's a cost and a benefit of using these very long acting drugs as we now have them available. One advantage of implants, of course, is if you're using a drug and you just take out the implant or the implant disappears, there's no tail. Now, um, going forward, when, when we prepare ourselves to go forward, there are, there are requirements. One of the requirements was show us new tools. And other requirements is worry about making multi-purpose tools. Sharon Hillier, who has directed for many years the, the Microbicide Network, has joined forces with us, with others, uh, in a committee activity to kind of um, take into consideration the possibilities of multi-purpose te technologies. And shown on the slide is, is this is her slide. Um, and, well, all the slides are other people's slides because I'm way too lazy ever to make slides. So thank you for everyone for whom I liberated slides. Um, so this is her slide. And she just shows you a few different ways of thinking about it. She shows you that a ring, and she's worked a lot on rings, whatever you put in the ring, you could also put some sort of birth control agent in there. And there's already a birth control ring. So combining an antiviral and maybe even an anti-SGD drug and a birth control agent is not impossible in a ring. And that's a very potentially very attractive use of rings if women learned and, and wanted to use them more reliably. Um, another idea is, you know, two products in the same device um, co-administered. And this is an example of, of Merck making an implant, for example, that would have both uh, Islotrevir and a birth control agent. And they certainly are thinking about doing that, uh, combined HIV prevention and birth control. And then what's another very attractive idea is simply making a, a, a pill that has two things in it. So it is possible already for us to make a birth control pill with uh, Discovy. And, and I know that um, um, some um, nonprofit organizations are working on this, on making a pill of reasonable size that a person, that a woman could take daily, as she might take a birth control pill, that would also provide uh, a, a Discovy or uh, nafil alfinamide um, and tricytabine uh, uh, HIV prevention. So it is certain that over the next seven years, we will not ignore the idea of, co of, of trying to do birth control and STD prevention and HIV prevention in some organized combined tool fashion. So now I wanna switch gears to something that kind of reliably has to be somewhat confusing. So everything I've talked about up to this point has been that we've learned to make over 30 years antiretroviral agents. And those agents were meant to treat HIV in such a way that people could live a normal lifespan. That's been accomplished. And those agents have also demonstrated themselves that they can serve as treatment as prevention. And that's been accomplished. Um, but it turns out that maybe we don't, that there may be other agents beyond antiretrovirals that could be used for HIV treatment and prevention. And the agents that have attracted the greatest attention are kind of a, a group of agents made by Mother Nature called broad neutralizing antibodies. So as we've learned so much about HIV, and this is the HIV virus and all these loops, and you see that we know that for HIV to enter a cell, it has to use this CD4 binding site. It has to find a cell and, and, and bind and get in. And then there are other spaces, because once it binds, it starts moving around in a particular way. So there are other places where the, vi the virus is vulnerable to being blocked by the human host defenses. And when somebody gets HIV infection, here's what happens. They get HIV infection, 
and the virus replicates and it's invisible for the first few days, but the host does not like having HIV. So the host that's been infected starts making antibodies and those antibodies are designed to attack HIV at the sites, at these very sites I just showed you. That's where those antibodies are binding. And as those antibodies are generated, people seroconvert. Those are the very antibodies we see that are the way we diagnose HIV as an HIV positive person through seroconversion. But by the time the antibodies get there, HIV is so plastic when it multiplies, and it multiplies so fast that the antibodies that were directed at, at one place, that place is no longer available. The virus has replicated what's called lack of fidelity. And as it's replicating, it knows that the host is coming after it. And so it changes so that those antibodies get there and they're rendered harmless. But the host doesn't give up. It's, it knows that the virus changed. So the host makes another antibody and that antibody gets there and it fails. And this goes on and on and on. And in untreated people, and there's a lot of untreated people, over 10 years or 20 years, those people will make antibodies, their cells that make antibodies will acquire um, the ability to make antibodies that are very broad because they've been attacking the virus without success for 10 years or 20 years. And those antibodies, while they will not do anything to the host virus, the one that's infecting that person that hasn't been treated, they will kill other viruses from other people because they're so broad. And those are called broad neutralizing antibodies. And so only eight, uh, only eight years ago did the technology develop for us to really isolate broad neutralizing antibodies. And once that technology was developed, the floodgates opened and many, many broad neutralizing antibodies were identified and developed working at many, many sites against the HIV virus. So about five years ago, um, the NIH inspired the vaccine network and the prevention network to work together to do a proof of concept study, not to develop a drug, just to understand the feasibility of using antibodies instead of antivirals to prevent the acquisition of HIV. And this was called the, these are called the antibody mediated prevention studies. And so these studies were set up to do a couple of things. They were set up first to see, can, is it safe to, to infuse these antibodies? Are there side effects from these antibodies? And then to determine, could you prevent HIV acquisition from some viruses using a, an antibody? And how much antibody would be successful? And, and how many different strains of HIV could you, could you avoid? And then there's a lot of sub opportunities of seeing lots of different science about whether these antibodies can work and how they work uh, as secondary goals. And what happened is we were able, we being the PTN and the VTN, were able to enroll with you know, thousands of people helping thousands of subjects. And these studies have come to a conclusion and the results are going to be published um, in the next few months, probably less than three months. Um, normally we would have shared all the results by now with the scientific community, but because there are no meetings, because the, the Cori meeting was the last meeting, the AIDS meeting, the results weren't ready, we don't have any meetings in the fall, we're kind of obligated to be circumspect in what we say until we've uh, kind of told all the study subjects and all the investigators all the results. I, I'll just say the following about the AMP study. The, the, the drug that we used, uh, VRCO1, we used one, we used one drug, VRCO1, that one drug we used was, was clearly safe. We did uh, 50,000 infusions of this drug, over 104 weeks in thousands of subjects, many thousands of subjects, both men and women at risk. The drugs were safe. And I'll say that there are very interesting, that the drugs um, had an effect. The, the, the antibody we used had an effect. Uh, the details of the effect, obviously I can't, I'm not at liberty because it's never been presented publicly or in a meeting, but it had an effect. And I think the results will be interesting uh, to the scientific community. And I'll say that the results are um, suggest that it, it that that uh, the hypothesis that antibodies can be used for prevention that that hypothesis remains alive as an alternative to antivirals and and the data that was observed suggests something we always thought we were doing a proof of concept with one drug because we only had one drug at the time 
And now we're looking at combinations of multiple drugs, just like we do with antivirals. We would combine two or three antibodies, not one antibody. And the combination that's being uh, receiving the greatest attention is a combination of a drug called BRCO7 from very similar to BRCO1, but broader, and then two other drugs. And when you put these three drugs together in a test tube, the three uh, antibodies together in a test tube, you kill 90x percent of all the viruses that we can find. So in summary, the AMP studies are completed. The results should soon be available. The results uh, suggest the general feasibility of this approach and, and suggest some other antibodies we could use. Now, the big tension is the juice and the squeeze, we say. Like, since we have so many antivirals and so many ways to deliver antivirals, and they, they appear so successful, do we need broad neutralizing antibodies? We have to weigh all the time and money it will cost us to compare to develop BNABs as prevention agents compared to the antiretroviral agents that we're already successfully using, some of which have already been approved and more of which will approve. So this will be the tension within the, the PTN, VTN community of, of making sure we use all of our resources most widely. So let me, let me end then in the next 10 minutes or so, with plenty of time and I, ho I hope you have comments more than questions. Let me end by saying what I've shown you is like a kind of a, a snapshot of the most obvious tools, the lowest hanging fruit. These are the tools that anybody in WAFAs and my job would, would be pursuing. Uh, but the tools alone are not going to be enough. And, and for we see, if we just use COVID as an example, but we learn this in HIV, there's no magic bullet. You need to combine inspire behavior change in every possible way, a variety of different behavior changes, whether it's safer harm reduction behaviors or whether it's using drugs properly or whether it's taking a vaccine. That needs to be combined with availability of treatment. And in the best of worlds, treatment is prevention at the same time, Provide, combined with preve biological prevention tools. And in and, and, and the COVID case, it's again antibodies and vaccines. And in the HIV case, it's again vaccines and all the PrEP agents, both antivirals and BNAPs. And in addition, so we have the biomedical interventions, we have behavioral interventions, and then what have been very successful in some settings are, are structural interventions. Uh, meaning seat belts, you know, where there's a mandate, you have to wear seat belts, or you've got to wear your glasses while driving if you can't pass your driving test without your glasses. So structural interventions for HIV are potentially important as well. And, and those three things are put together in, in combination prevention and in integrated strategies. So I just want to give you, now I'm kind of going forward to where, where we've pretty much committed ourselves to what we think are, again, essential activities for the network. Not, and what I present to you, it's not the limit, it's just the things that have already, where the train has already left the station. So one issue is the incredible risk of, of transgender people. Wafa and Ken Mayer and Beatrice uh, organized a meeting a few years ago uh, with a supplement that I, I point out to you here about a call to action to deal with the very high risk of, of transgender people. So um, uh, HPTN investigators um, have developed a trial called HPTN091, which is pretty straightforward to enroll a mod, it's a pilot really, to enroll 310 uh, transgender people into a one-to-one -one randomization of providing different kinds of services, looking for services that would be so attractive that they would give an opportunity for robust HIV prevention activities at the same time that there are other services provided to transgender people. Um, the study has not started yet, it's in the planning phase still. Um, like all of our studies, it requires a lot of work and, and a lot of uh, funding, uh, but we're excited about the possibility this could, could, could get off the ground. And, I, and if you look back to uh, Dr. Kellum's success with HPT and OA2, there's a similar flavor of looking at kind of the big picture and trying to inspire uh, changes that make the tools work better. That's what's going on with HPTN 091. And this is just the notion that these are the more specific objectives, and you'll see it would be done multinationally in Rio, Houston, San Francisco, New York, and Philadelphia. And those sites were selected because there are investigators and populations who could benefit, we think, from this study. So we hope this moves forward. I would point out that this, not surprisingly, is a collaboration well, and everything in the PTN are collaborations with NI, 
AID, NIMH, and the and NIDA, the uh, Drug Abuse uh, Institute, often also with uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But in this case, I'm sure NIMH is, is playing a role in this study as well. Another study, uh, and this one very much involves NIDA, the, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, the, this study is led by uh, Steve Shapton and Nabila El Basal. Again, it's a study in planning. It's to, again, link a lot of services together, integrating services in order to reduce the acquisition of HIV in people who inject drugs. And uh, the, the point here is, is called is a mobile health delivery approach that, that combines treatment as prevention and PrEP in the, and, and in medical opioid use disorder where uh, biological interventions are available as well for the opioid use disorder. They anticipate enrolling 885 subjects in a two-arm study in a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and what's really important here and what's unique beyond these kind of comparative uh, combining of activities is these vans. So in order to get out to the subjects who are hard to reach, these vans are <coughs> outfitted even as we speak to use in the study to provide all the tools in the toolbox to try and demonstrate that, that you can aggressively reduce risk of HIV acquisition in this, in this at-risk population. And then the last thing I'll say is about the United States. Now, let, let me point out, as I've talked about integrated strategies, I've really heavily focused on the US. And that's because, not because the PTN is not a multinational organization, it's because of limited time and because the three studies I'm describing are kind of the furthest along. Um, the, the question of our obligation in other continents, Asia, Africa, South America, I think many plans have already been laid out for integrated strategies and those different continents that are more precise to the populations. And I would invite Wafa probably to add kind of some forward thinking about the other countries as soon as I stop talking, uh, because actually she's really the integrated strategy guru. But for, for the integrated strategies, what she and her team have been working on has a lot to do with the, the before the COVID epidemic, the um, commitment to end of AIDS 2030 in the United States. This commitment is not $109 million. That's the kind of beginning of the commitment. It's a much bigger commitment. And end of AIDS, which I think all of you are familiar with, um, and was very, very heavily pub publicized before COVID, was like, okay, we know who's getting this infection in the United States. We know where they are, kind of understand why they're getting infection. Can't we do better? And the better was not rocket science. The better was, let's diagnose this disease more readily and let people know their status. Hard to reach people, we have to figure out some way to reach them. Once people are reached, we have to link them to medical care. Treatment is such profound prevention, we have to make treatment event uh, available leading to viral suppression. Um, we, we need to make PrEP available to those who are negative and at the highest risk. And lastly, um, we have a pretty good idea of how to identify clusters and people tend to uh, transmit HIV in clusters, and those clusters uh, could be, uh, we can use molecular tools to identify clusters and respond properly to those clusters. So these are the four kind of um, highlights of the government plan. And, and appropriately, since the HIV Prevention Network uh, is kind of the, the forefront of uh, NIH's network activities for prevention, the PTN, charged a very large group of people led by Chris Byer, Leron Nelson, and Bob Remian to help us think through, and in collaboration with many other people, the best way to use our resources to help with the end of AIDS. This very complicated slide, I, I don't really expect you to memorize. It's from our the group that are trying to develop a trial called HP10096. The trial's in its development form, but you can see that everyone's kind of recognized. HIV negative people and HIV positive people are both being provided tools. And then this, this work recognizes that it's not just kind of HIV acquisition is not simply a biological event. It's an event that is, is mediated by societal factors that are very large. Um, and that those societal factors need 
consideration at the same time we consider biological intervention tools. So the team is working on this um, assiduously um, and uh, they have a lot of partners. You'll see we would not do this without CDC and HRSA, NI, AI, uh, several NIH institutes and perhaps other partners will come on as well as this gets better and better refined. And this study, as you can see, is called 096. So the three kind of studies I presented, just as an example of integrated studies, are 091, 094, and 096. As I stop in the next one second, I really want Wafa to add to this and talk about, for at least five minutes, about what she thinks about our global integrated strategies. Let me then thank um, everyone. You know, the PTN's a big network with literally thousands of investigators and teams. Tens of thousands. I think we we estimated in the uh, we enrolled something like fifty six thousand women in our clinical trials. Huge numbers of participants have participated in these studies. Um, the funders that you see on the slide plus other funders. These are our federal funders: the Gates Foundation, pharmaceutical industry. They've been huge funders and partners of ours. And then, as I said, all the slides belong to somebody else. So Wafa and everybody else whose slides I used. Thank you for letting me use your slides. I hope I did them justice. So I'm gonna stop exactly 45 minutes. And Wafa, why don't you spend just a few minutes adding onto this, if that's okay. And then we can together answer any questions. Sure, and thank you very much, uh, Mike, for um, a superb presentation of um, a very uh, extensive and complex uh, research agenda for HIV uh, prevention. So thank you. I'll add a few uh, words regarding, as you suggested, the, our global perspective in terms of integrated strategy. So as, um, as was very evident from Mike's presentation, the HPTN is focused on two dimensions, two areas, one discovery and the other one I call impact. So discovery side is identifying new uh, HIV prevention tools like um, some of the new PrEP agents, antiviral or monoclonal antibodies, for example. And then the impact side is how can we uh, get the most out of these um, discoveries, these new agents in terms of uh, enhancing their effectiveness in various populations. So focusing on the impact side of our agenda uh, globally beyond the focus in the US, I just wanna mention a couple of ideas we've had uh, moving forward. I think one would be um, uh, focusing on women in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, and we've been thinking about a way of designing a, maybe a cluster randomized uh, study that will be focused on uh, women accessing family planning clinics where we could provide an intervention that integrates uh, prevention of HIV, prevention of STIs, as well as also uh, family planning intervention. So that's just uh, one example and compare that to the standard of care, which is usually uh, parallel uh, services rather than integrated approach. We've also uh, as well been thinking about um, uh, the global population of men who have sex with men and transgender persons around the world and thinking as well of uh, potentially doing a, a study that may look at a two level factor design uh, where we have a community plus an, an individual intervention. So the community intervention may include um, uh, provider sensitization, community workshops, risk mitigation, and then the individual intervention uh, would uh, may include um, a, a status neutral approach where we're focusing on both PrEP as well as treatment, knowing that these populations have uh, great difficulty in accessing both treatment and prevention. These are just some, a few examples of some of our integrated strategy agenda moving forward. Um, so now I'm going to move on to some of our questions that have come in, uh, Mike, during your presentation. I think one is, um, would you touch, uh, please, or share your thoughts in terms of how the AMP study results uh, can inform vaccine research? Uh, sure. So I can tell you, yeah, what, what's going to happen with the AMP study is, um, as the results are presented, we will demonstrate kind of our understandings and misunderstandings of what happens when you give a monoclonal antibody, a single monoclonal antibody, as we compare it to monkey results. And so um, the results will, will provide an idea of, at least with that antibody, BRCO1, what concentration might have been required to have kind of make it into a single drug 
Um, and it also informs the kinds of concentrations that would be necessary for a vaccine to generate if it's like that antibody to prevent HIV acquisition. So um, as you see, when we publish these results, there's a lot of information that will link, and the, maybe one of the biggest values of this, of that whole study is, it links the lab, the monkey, and the human. And so that question is pretty prescient because we will address um, what we learned and how it informs vaccine potential. Now, only vaccine potential insofar as antibodies are concerned. Um, many vaccines, of course, are trying to stimulate antibodies and T cell mediated immunity. So it would be unfair to indict, you know, like to say, well, one, one comment might be, well, here's the concentration of antibody you needed for one antibody. And can a vaccine ever really reach that concentration? But most of the vaccines uh, do both T cells and um, antibodies. So I think it'll be, it, it will be informative. That's the best way to put it. Um, and the graphs that are shown will be informative as well. Uh, we've previously published like how much mm. antibody it, it takes to protect a monkey. Um, and um, it's very interesting information. And, and the other thing to know about the, this antibody virus one or antibodies in general, you have to look at what viruses are cir circulating in the community. The antibody can only be as good as its ability to inhibit viruses that are in the community. So if you have an antibody that inhibited 90% of viruses in the community, and you got enough concentration, you ought to have an incredibly wonderful outcome. And, and that actually is what's going on right now in the COVID world. Monoclonal antibodies are right now achieving pretty rapid success because COVID is very susceptible to the monoclonal antibodies. But HIV is much more complex and, and any one antibody will not kill more than a moderate number of all the strains that are circulating, which is why combinations are this. So I think, you don't, I think the, the person who asked the question will find it interesting. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mike. I mean, another question is um, is now that we and we're of course very excited about the um, the results of HPTN 3 and having uh, this new very promising uh, long acting agent uh, carbotegravir injectable carbotegravir uh, with demonstrated superiority um, to oral uh, Truvada. Uh, how does that complicate future? Um, prevention trials in terms sure. of, you know, comparator arm, the usual uh, dilemma of what is the comparator arm? Yeah, I think, we're, well, I think in general, um, we're done with placebos. Um, I mean, it's a very complicated answer to that. It affects not, not just the PTN and its tools, it affects the vaccine field. Um, so the vaccine field has, has adapted by providing Truvada at will in the in the background, and whereas I think one of the, the question belies the idea that because we're using the word superior, that maybe we're obligated to provide Truvada as the comparator, which would be you know a difficult uh, mile or a yard yard post, um, and but I, I don't know. No one knows the answer. I will say. But the reason Truvada was superior, almost certainly, and as presented by Dr. Landovitz, is because people didn't always reliably take their pills. So it's not biologically, in, in my mind, it's, if it, it doesn't have a huge biological advantage as, as an agent, it has a big mechanical advantage. Whether that mechanical advantage justifies it using it as a direct comparison in studies is going to be determined by the ethics community and the FDA and a lot of other people. My notion is some studies really will compare something to cabotegravir. Other studies will continue to compare something to uh, Truvada uh, or to, to, to Discovy. I don't know, Wafi, you may have strong feelings about this. No, I mean, I think you're right. It's a challenge for all prevention studies, uh, whether, you know, the next biomedical or even other, uh, and um, whether it be vaccines or antivirals. Um, um, I think we'll have to come up, and there's a lot of work being done, certainly by the net people in the network, but also outside the network in terms of novel study design and so on. Yeah. Now, remember, too, that the HP10 is inti intimately involved. In, the investigators in the HP10 are not COVID naive. They're very involved in COVID activities. And, and the vaccines for COVID and the monoclonals for COVID um, and a couple of drugs for COVID, they set the same stage for how do we do COVID trials. So the question you're asking about cabotegravir Truvada that took us a long time to develop, that same question is gonna come up with COVID in the next eight weeks, okay? It, it, as drugs are actually approved uh, that are available for the treatment of COVID or maybe even the prevention of COVID, 
well, then how do you justify a placebo? We're done with placebos, you know? So we're, we're preparing now for the equipoise, and that's what we call, when things get out of balance, it's an equipoise crisis. We're preparing for equipoise crisis um, mm -hmm. in COVID and for PTM. Yeah, it for almost HIV. reminds reminds one of, you know, when you're uh, studying a new antibiotic versus an older antibiotic, and the, the design becomes quite different, and the analysis mm -hmm. quite different. Um, another question is about the, um, the agenda uh, regarding persons who inject drugs. I mean, I think you shared um, the, um, the planned HPTN-094 integrated strategy studies, but the question is whether we are considering uh, potentially using uh, long-acting agents and, uh, uh, or MPTs, for example, uh, for prevention amongst um, uh, persons who inject drugs. Uh, prevention uh, speaking, of yeah, yeah, this is for both. As we, as we prepared for the future, um, this is speaking for Waf and I, everything we wrote said, well, we're going to have to insert new tools when they become available. So my supposition is we have to be careful as we start studies that we don't ignore the fact that a better tool came along. It's like, you know, you're not going to use a, when, you're not going to use a, a rock if a hammer comes along. So the answer is yes. Uh, for any of the studies that were proposed, we, we, and I think for 096 and then I think Waffa is, is, you know, I think she'll agree. For all those studies, we're preparing to insert new tools once they're approved, if it's at all feasible, if the tools are better, if we think we can get a better outcome. Yeah, and the, exactly the idea is to sort of in a seamless manner have a trajectory from the discovery part of our portfolio to the impact part of our portfolio, which is um, inserting uh, new discoveries into uh, integrated strategy uh, studies. Um, maybe one last question is, um, you know, the, um, I don't know if you have such information, but somebody asked the questions about the potential cost differential between different prevention tools. Uh, and a lot of that is still unknown, but uh, what do you think? Uh, that's a good, what we're doing, the PTN is supporting, um, <laughs> it's a good, very good question. People love to say antibodies are never financially practical, but before the COVID disruption, NIH was already negotiating with the Serum Institute of India for material for antibodies that would cost, you know, no more, be comparable to antivirals. So, um, and I think COVID has disrupted a lot of this because all these agencies have turned over to COVID, 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 but uh, there was sensitivity to antibody costs. Um, and it was never off the table that they could be made feasible. Um, a bigger issue is the, the price of cabotegavir. And right. in fact, PTN is supporting, um, I'll be very, Granular. See, PTN is supporting Dr. Walensky's team to kind of look at the kind of price, the cost of the drug that's appropriate to make it competitive with other PrEP agents, okay? And to try and create an environment where that is the cost, right? Where we don't, we don't want to have spent uh, five years and, and a lot of money on developing an agent with the NIH as a sponsor that would not be available to the very people who would benefit. So mm -hmm. we, we intend to be as best we can helpful in, in making sure that the cost of the drug is acceptable uh, to the uh, country uh, for those who want to use it. Yeah. And, and as I said, Rochelle Walensky at Harvard has, has a, a um, what do we call it, a project with us, mm -hmm. I guess. It doesn't have a number though. We need it to have a number. HPT and 09 something, I guess. No, we're calling 083-3, dash three. Dash three. Dash yeah, three. Call the age. It's yeah. called dash three. That's right. Oh, one, two, three. HPD and OA three dash three is exactly the answer to that question. So the idea is to hopefully be able to um, do this analysis that would benefit both individuals within this country, the U.S., who uh, need access to the drug, but also other countries around the world, uh, low and middle income countries in particular. Um, Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cohen and Mike um, for uh, joining us today and thank all of you uh, from all over the world who joined us for this webinar. And I'll hand it back to Fatima. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and, and thank you, Lafa, for this really informative session. Um, the session has been recorded and will be posted on the ICAP website um, for future dissemination, um, as well as if uh, there are colleagues of yours that have been unable to attend the live um, session. I also just want to announce that we have some upcoming Grand Rounds webinars 
Um, the next one uh, will take place uh, Tuesday, October 20th at 9 a.m. And we will have a guest speaker from the University of Washington. So we hope you can stay tuned and join us on October 20th. Um, have a great day, everyone. And thanks, everybody. Take good care. Bye-bye.